Welcome to the 24-7 Prayer Podcast. I'm Brian Heasley. And I'm Hannah Heather. This is the first podcast that we've ever done together. And it's 24-7 Prayer's inaugural podcast series, uh, Stories from Around the Movement. 24-7 Prayer Stories from Around the Movement. And we are going on a 10-week journey where Hannah and I will be asking questions of people who are doing extraordinary things in very normal places, following an amazing God in a really radical way all around the world. And our hope and our passion is that these stories communicate something of what a prayerful life looks like and how a prayerful life is outworked in the day to day. It's exciting. That's right. I love that. And well, our heart behind this podcast is really that, you know, this isn't, we don't, want people to tune in thinking, oh, we're going to hear a bunch of experts telling us their well-crafted, curated content. What we really wanted to do was sit down and, and actually tell some raw and honest stories, like really kind of lift the curtain a little bit behind some some people who are like amazing practitioners and they're doing incredible things. But just lift the curtain a little bit and say, you know, don't tell us necessarily even your best story, but could you tell us your most honest moments in prayer and, and what has saying yes to God led to in your life? We have laughed, we've cried, mm. and we've uh, done everything in between. We haven't slept yet for any of the stories. <laughs> no, maybe more shockingly is, uh, Brian, how much sugar have you been having in your coffee while we've been recording these podcasts? Well, it's not a normal thing, but they had sugar cubes this morning, so I popped three in my coffee. And three sugar cubes, you guys. Is it just me or is that a lot? <laughs> I don't know. What is a lot of sugar? I, it was brown sugar. Brown sugar always looks like it's healthy. <laughs> <laughs> we're awake and we're there. Yeah, we're excited to go on this journey with you guys. Amazing. And remember, like we're like Homer and Homer. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah finds that funny. But you know, like Homer's, Homer's Iliad. That's like Hannah. I'm like Homer Simpson. <laughs> yeah. um... We ask different questions and think in different ways, but... Same kind of outcome. Hopefully between us, we have asked what you would want to ask. Yes. So what you're about to hear is quite extraordinary, I would say. Would you agree, Brian? Deep, moving. I think you and I, when we were having this conversation, I found that, I, you know me, I'm a bit, I cry a lot anyway, but I found it quite moving. Mm. And this is it's a beautiful story from uh, Beirut, from Lebanon. Our friend Christelle, who's the director of 24-7 Prayer in Lebanon shares with us what it's like to live through a revolution and an explosion and still keep your faith. So, yeah, amazing. If you are at the minute going through a tough and challenging time, yeah, I would suggest this, this podcast will speak to your soul mm. and bring you relief, encouragement and the courage to keep going. So today we have uh, a dear friend of 24-7 Prayer, our national coordinator in Lebanon, Christelle. Christelle, lovely to have you with us. How are you today? Hi, it's really great to have to be here. Um, I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Hannah? Yeah, I'm doing good. Thank you. Christelle, you're getting married in, what, in two weeks? Yes. So even more amazing. Thank you so much for being here and taking the time to share with us today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Crystal, could you just tell us a little bit about the context you find yourself in? Explain a little bit about Lebanon, Beirut, and what it looks like for you and for Christianity in general in that nation. The beautiful thing about my country is that to a certain extent, we are free to worship God freely. So there aren't any limitations on how you worship, who you worship, which is very beautiful. And there is a freedom to share about your beliefs um, in most of the areas. Let's say it like that, because in some areas it's more difficult. But in Beirut, it's very free. Mm, beautiful. I think it's the only country actually in the Middle East uh, where we have this freedom. Wow. And do you meet opposition? Is there a, you know, obviously I, I was out there last year and you hear the call to prayer and we realize that there's, is it probably a majority Muslim nation? And w do you get opposition even though like you're free from in a government sense and all of that? Is it is it challenging or do you just have to be careful? 
Uh, it depends on the area you're in and who you are talking to. So there are extremists in any religion and like everywhere you can, f- you can face uh, some opposition. Uh, but most of the time, especially if you're in Beirut, which is um, a, very, a city that's more open to people, uh, you can have free conversations with people. Uh, But in areas like uh, the suburbs of Beirut or even in the in the cities that are like Tripoli in the north or Saida in the south, you feel like there's more pressure to keep your religion to yourself. So in those areas, the church is a bit more shy, but it still has the freedom to share about the gospel, but they need to be very careful. So, for example, this it's actually a story that's told a lot in Saida here, uh, where I am right now. Okay. There was a, a church here in Saida that shared the gospel all the time. So people would go out on the streets, they would um, distribute Bibles and Amazing. share people God's love with people. And at some point, someone came in and shot a missionary here. I think her name was Bonnie. And since then, the church closed down. And the only church that is still there is uh, a bit far away from Saida. It's in a Christian um, village uh, that is a bit far away from Saida because of Mm -hmm. that event that happened. Wow. Uh, So it's really hard to say. You can face opposition, of course. And Christians need to be very, sometimes very careful. Other times... It's pretty free. So it's really hard to say. There's a, a large spectrum. And Christelle, we know obviously um, a little bit about the sort of the revolution that began um, in October in 2019. Um, could you share with us a little bit about what on earth it was like to live through a moment like that in history, living in Beirut? And I believe you and your team actually like set up a prayer tent in the middle of Martyr mm-hmm. Square. Could you share a little bit about about that? Yes, in 2019, I don't really know what happened exactly mm-hmm. because everything started very suddenly. Mm. People went down on the streets. They would burn tires, close the close the roads. Some people got got stuck in their houses for a couple of days. Wow. And everyone, they were just young people on the streets, really crazy with everything that's going on. I think what started it was that the government wanted uh, people to pay uh, in order to use the WhatsApp. Wow. And this was the only app that was uh, just the communication through it was free. And so everyone went crazy because we we pay a lot for everything else and we don't really get anything (laughs) or we get very, very little. So I think that decision from the government just made everyone crazy. And then everybody headed down to Martyrs Square, was it? There was, mm-hmm. was it like close to a million people in, uh, protesting for various things? Yes, so many people came from the south, from the north, from all over the country, uh, Muslims, Christians, like everyone. It was crazy. It was the first revolution in years that didn't have like a political party. Mm-hmm like uh, in the middle or wow. uh, or caused by a political party. Everyone was holding Lebanese flags. Like usually during revolutions that happened in the past, you would see an orange flag yeah. or a green flag or mm-hmm. like de- depending on the party that the people are uh, affiliated to. But in this revolution, everyone was, people were fed up from the government and we just love that cry for justice. And so we went to the to Martyr Square where everyone else was setting tents and just chanting day and night and almost partying all time all the time. Mm-hmm. And we we stayed there for I don't remember how 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 long, but yeah, we sat in the tent and we were praying and people were coming and worshiping with us and we shared um, about God and his love and his desire for justice. And it was just something 
that filled me personally with hope. Wow. That's an incredibly brave thing to do in the middle of a revolution, to go to Martyr Square and set up a tent where people could pray. Yeah. Were you scared, Christelle? Because we see, you know, we see the images on the news and, we, you know, we see people coming in and attacking protesters mm-hmm. and wearing all yeah. black. And, and like, it, it, it looks yeah. really scary. Were you scared sitting in that tent praying? Um, during the day, it was pretty safe. It was at night that the that it was quite dangerous because, like you said, people from different parties that opposed this revolution yeah. uh, would come and um, do acts of violence. Many many died. They were shot. Wow. So they would advise us not to stay at night. So after a certain hour, we weren't advised to stay there. Did you go home? Yes. Good. It was really scary. Like at night, especially like girls alone, we wouldn't, like people wouldn't allow us uh, to stay alone because uh, it was very dangerous and very unexpected. It sounds terrifying. Wow. And Christelle, just give us an idea of how it other than terrifying and I guess that's kind of mixed up with a sense of hopefulness for your country and your nation Mm -hmm. yeah you're trying to get people to pray in the middle of that just can you somehow unpack a little bit and feel free to take your time about how you actually felt and how how it felt to do that then I honestly one of the things that I deeply felt was that it it was it felt like God was revolting with us. Wow! Like there was there is so much injustice, and so much pain that's been, uh, like just layers and layers of pain from the past, from our the generation of our parents that was passed down to us, and that we will probably pass on to our children. There's just so much injustice, mm. so much, and so. Going there as just one people um, and just offering some real hope because I I know that every Lebanese person who went there felt hope. Wow. But us, because we have God, uh, we have a different type of hope, one that's one that's deeper, I think, one that has I don't know how to explain it exactly. Like, words fail me. You're doing a very beautiful job. (laughs) Thank you. Um, But we really, I could really see God work Mm. uh, through everyone who came uh, to that tent. People would come, they would draw their pain. Uh, They would, uh, there was this one boy who came in and um, he was just drawing some some just shapes, weird shapes, and there was a cross at the middle. And I asked him, what are you drawing? He's like, that's a maze, and I'm here at the beginning, and I know that God is in the middle, and I want to get to God. It's beautiful. This boy, this boy, I think he was from Tripoli, and he had never met Christian people before. I think he was in a family that didn't really mix with Christians. Mm -hmm. And so this revolution or this uh, gathering in this one place, it allowed us to reach people. It allowed us to reach people with hope that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Yeah. Wow. It's amazing how God can use even the most um, surprising and chaotic situations almost to actually bring hope. Isn't that just like God? And. And and Christelle, obviously, it probably didn't pan out like everybody wanted. It didn't end up, you know, there wasn't the full-scale change and all of that. And we know that your government continued to be inept yeah. and not mm-hmm. particularly good at what they do, which within a year of that, well, by August the 4th, 2020, you had that huge explosion of ammonium nitrate in the port of yeah. Beirut, which killed over 200 people, injured 7,000 people, made 300,000 people homeless, and affected $15 billion worth of property damage, mm-hmm. one explosion, in your city, a year on from the revolution. Crazy, right? Super crazy. How do you go from like the hope of a revolution to 
the despair of an explosion. Wow. I still, I'm still trying to figure that out. Yeah. <sighs> it's very heavy. Yeah, we were, we were very disappointed when nothing happened after the revolution. People tried to create parties that were different from the political parties we had before, but that failed. And I think the explosion was, I think that's the worst thing that's ever happened to me or to Beirut. We still like me and my sister, we were, um, we were in the city when it happened. And I know I was affected, but my sister was so much more affected. And it's just, breaks me because she's a young person who just who has life before her and she still has flashbacks and I know that so many people also have that yeah I I really don't know what to tell you no it's fine we we love hearing your voice uh, and listening to the hope that you have but we understand also the trauma you experienced where where was Jesus in all of this? You know, it's it's hard to say this, but only 200 died that day because if it wasn't for God, I think thousands would have been dead. If you hear the stories of the people, so we went, after the explosion, we went down on the streets to clean and help and listen to people. And you wouldn't believe the times we heard like this type of story. Like I often nap here, like I nap here every day. But that day I decided not to nap here. Mm. I was supposed to be in Beirut that day, but I decided to stay at my parents' house in the village for a day longer. They, there are thousands of stories like this. And people would come to the place where they should have napped or to their house and it was destroyed. So like, I I really do believe that God saved so many lives that day. So many. Yeah. Thank you. And I realize we're asking you some quite, we've gone quite deep here, Christelle, quite quickly. (laughs) And I'm really grateful to you for your honesty. And, you know, honestly, the stuff that you're saying right now, it's going to help people. It gives people an insight. Yeah, thank you. How, like, (laughs) I was going to say, I was always going to say, why are you still a Christian? But I I know why (laughs) you are still a Christian. But, you know, how do you, how do you, I mean, I remember a few years ago we were talking and you told me, there was a there was a minor kind of like little Hezbollah vibe going on. It's probably more than a vibe actually. And there was a man running up and down your street with a rocket launcher. Mm-hmm. And I remember you were. It was during lockdown, but I mean, you wouldn't have gone out anyway if it hadn't been lockdown. But how do you, in the midst of that kind of life, you know, how do how do you keep going? How does how do you maintain a prayer life? How do we? You know, because there are people who will be listening to this who will be living in challenging situations. And and it's easy for me, Brian Heasley, 55-year-old middle-class man living in England to go, oh, this is what you need to do, that's what you need to do. Whereas <laughs> you have lived through some stuff that I will never experience. So there are people out there who would love to hear, how do you keep going as a Christian in the middle of all of this, Christelle? I really pray that you never experience this. <laughs> but... Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I think at times like these, faith is all that's left and Mm. God is all that's left. Because when something like this happens, especially in Lebanon, especially in this country, it feels like it's always standing on a cliff and anything could tilt it and it could fall. So when something that, that scary happens our future is kind of like it it instantly freezes because you don't know what the next minute will bring if it will escalate or not um will a war start who knows should i stay home or should i leave to the village or a safer area and you don't have any 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 answers yeah so the only thing that you can turn to 
is someone who is sovereign, someone who knows, who can see everything and someone that you can trust that will guide you and take care of you. And that's God. And I think that even though these are really difficult situations that I've gone through and my people have gone through, but for me personally, it helped me cling closer to God and draw nearer to him. So good. Such good wisdom. He hasn't failed to encourage me and to strengthen me. And I'm super grateful. Amazing. I um, I really love what you shared, Christelle, about the fact that Jesus is our hope and it's a different kind of hope, you know, then there's the hope in a revolution, the hope that things will change. And, um, but that the hope that Jesus brings is this different hope. And I guess as you think ahead to, um, the future of 24 seven Lebanon, what are some of your hopes and dreams? And uh, something we've been asking people in this podcast series is, um, you know, what would a spiritual awakening look like in your context? Like, what would it look like for, you know, for God to be doing something, you know, amongst you? And uh, yeah, what what are some of your hopes? When I imagine a spiritual awakening, I picture people who who go to prayer as a first response. So I see... And like the way I see the churches here, I love the churches here, but in general, prayer is just something that you do before you do something else. Yeah. Or you just stick it to something that you're doing like, oh, I'm doing this beautiful ministry. Let's pray for a little bit. Yeah, we do exactly the same thing over here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So when I imagine a spiritual awakening, I just imagine people who are very aware of God, that prayer is something that we do. It's not something that we stick to something else we're doing. Yeah. Wow. And what's beautiful is your, and I know you're a graphic designer, and you are a beautiful creator of online content, I think, out of all our 24-7 prayer Instagrams and stuff that yours is definitely the, the, the I, I love it. It's fantastic. I often send you little messages <laughs> going, it's brilliant. I don't understand what it says because it's in Arabic, but it looks beautiful. <laughs> but you've, you've put some, uh, you've, you've shared some stuff about prayer online. I think you shared one reel and it somehow ended up going into lots of different Arabic contexts yeah that was quite surprising but because I guess yeah it's just surprising but it's it's the the beauty of this stuff moving around and and the fluidity of being able to get stuff into other nations can you just tell us a little bit about that yeah that was a really fun reel for me to create because uh, it kind of demystifies some things but very subtly so the only thing that I said that I think was difficult for people to accept was do you pray because you need to because it's a uh, it's a duty or it's something that you're forced to do or do you do it because you love God and you can't wait to spend time with him or you can't wait to talk to him Mm. in a country or in a in a context where people feel guilty for not praying because it's a it's something that they have to do it's shocking. Uh, like God is not a friend. He is my almost like almost like a boss. Like he tells me what to do. Right. And I want to please him, so I obey. And it's rarely out of love, which is really sad. But it's often out of obligation. Mm-hmm. And that fluidity that I tried to bring to prayer was offensive and so that reel got (laughs) very very viral I wouldn't say viral like uh, um, something that uh, people that don't aren't interested in prayer would see but viral within the community where people Mm -hmm. uh, love prayer and follow up with those this kind of content Mm -hmm. Uh, so I got a lot of messages saying uh, that my religion is not 
the the correct one that um, I shouldn't pray to three gods. I don't know where that came from. I didn't even mention that. Um, so it, it just got a bit out of hand, and I I just tried to be very kind in uh-huh. my responses. <laughs> yeah. It's that beautiful, like, offense of grace, isn't it? It's Jesus saying, I've no, I like, I don't call you servants, I call you friends. It's really very offensive for God to say that to us, isn't it, as humans? It's very shocking. Yeah. So it's very shocking, but it's beautiful, I think, to be reminded of quite how shocking those words are, like, in that Middle Eastern context that you're in, because we can get a little bit over familiar, can't we, with, like, the shock of grace. You know, like it mm-hmm. should hit you right between the eyes that 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 moment that Jesus looks at us and says, I don't call you servants, I call you friends. Like that is that is shocking grace. And um, yeah, thank you for reminding us of that today. <laughs> I appreciate that. Did you know as well, it was uh, just while we're on the, actually this is totally off tangent, but that's okay. That's fine. Christelle was the first person to tell me I was a micro influencer. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> But you, you started a phenomenon there, Crystal. <laughs> she, I said, am I an influence? She went, no, you're a micro-influencer. And I was like, thank you very much. That's brilliant. <laughs> well, I love that. Uh, and Crystal, can I just ask another quick question, just while I'm on, on a random tangent? Do the traf- all, all the traffic lights in Beirut and all the street lights, they just didn't work when I was out there. Is that still the case? In some places, in others... Uh... Some organization are, organizations are um, putting up solar panels to oh wow yeah to make them work. I quite like a world where there are no traffic lights. I think it's good. I think people <laughs> work it out for themselves. It did make Beirut probably the craziest city I've ever driven in. <laughs> I can imagine it is a crazy city. <laughs> and when you when you create content, getting back to micro influencer and you being a real influencer. How does your you you've you've written a lot of stuff for twenty four seven prayer now in Arabic, uh, and how do, yeah. is that generally well received? Do you think we need to continually contextualize the Christian faith in an Arabic speaking language? So unfortunately, um, there are very there are very few resources like in in the Lebanese church or Arabic Arab speaking church. There are very few resources that are created for the Arab speaking church. Mm-hmm. So usually it's uh, it's English content that's translated. Right. And so it rarely hits the point. That's really interesting. Yeah, so it's often like my friend came to me the other day and she told me like how do you translate something well? And I told her you really can't. Mm. Wow. So many words get lo- get lost in translation. So mu- so much meaning uh, doesn't get transferred well uh, in translation. So I do think that the best way to reach an Arab church is to create Arab content from scratch. Amazing. And be inspired, maybe of course, be inspired by what other people have done in different languages, but adapt it not just translate it and that's something actually that i'm struggling with a lot mm-hmm. because we we learn everything like our schools are in are in english we have taught to think in english so it's very difficult sometimes to to come up with something that isn't tainted if you want i don't know maybe tainted is a isn't the best word to use but affected maybe by um, the English structure of things, the way you structure a sentence or the way you would express yourself, it's completely different. Yeah. And it's something I am really striving to to do in, with my team. Yeah. That's wow. amazing. It's to create content, yeah. And you do a phenomenal job on the 24-7 Prayer Lebanon website. You can see some of the, yeah, the great content you. you create. So thank you for that, Christelle. Yeah. We we have one question we've been asking everybody as we kind of draw these things to a close. And Hannah has it written down and I've lost it on my pad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Christelle, um, we'd love to know, um, 
when, as you reflect back on your life and your journey of faith and your journey with God, what is one experience of prayer that you will never forget? Something recently happened to me. Let me just share my experience and you can judge it. <laughs> we're not judging it. We're just listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I was trying to put a title on it, but it doesn't really fit in a title. So last year, um, I purposely took a class in order to meet more people and to make more friends. And through this class, I made a friend with a girl and we became pretty close. It, it was a good friendship. She was a bit weird, but it was really fun to, to get to know her. And the more I gotten to know her, she started sharing some pretty dark things with me. I was very shocked at the level of detail that she would go into telling me her stories. And um, this girl faces demons almost every day. Like she dreams about them. She sees them at night and... I would get scared when I would listen to her stories. And I introduced Jesus to her multiple times, but she was just too scared to get close to anything holy. And I just kept a relationship with her. I knew that she didn't want to be pushed. And then... One day she came to me and she told me something that was really, really difficult. And I told her, you know, I could pray for you. Like, I could pray, I could fast for you. Would you like me to do this? And she's like, yes, please. And she had never asked me to pray for her before. So that was a big breakthrough. And so I started praying for her purposely and I would fast for her and... I I did that for about a week or so. And then towards the end of the week, I started wrestling with the idea, like, should I, should I stop? Should I not stop? It's just so disappointing. Nothing's going on. And then that day she texts me and she's like, I had a dream. I saw Jesus in my dream. Wow. And she shared her dream with me and it was just so beautiful and there were some things that I explained to her uh, that was some references from the Bible, from uh, the story of Noah. And she actually saw the cross. She saw Jesus. Wow. Amazing. And I don't think I've, yeah, I don't think I've ever, I've ever seen an answer to prayer this big. Like I didn't expect God to, to show up this powerfully to her. She is still on a journey, but she is getting closer every time. And this gives me a lot of hope. So, yeah, I think this is one of the stories that I could never forget. Wow, Mm. amazing. It's so beautiful. Christelle, just as we we finish here, I just wondered if you could pray for us. And I'd love you to do that in Arabic because I just think there's something yeah. prophetic in here in that language on this podcast. Uh, so if you could pray, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, amen. Of course. Ya Rab, ma'adhamak, ya ilahe. Shukran ya Rab, la anak hadir mana ya Rab, bikil awet. Shukran ya Rab, ala lahdiya li hiya sala. Shukran ya Rab, la anak. خليت يا رب موضوع الصلاة يكون هين تحت نتقابل معك ونحكي معك يا رب قد ايه انت عظيم يا رب صلي يا رب انك تخلينا ندوق طعمك يا رب الطيب وصلاحك صلي يا رب انك تساعدنا نكون واعيين على حضورك بحياتنا اكتر ساعدنا يا رب انه نلتقى معك بطرق جديدة يا رب هيدي الحياة كتير صعبة بس انت وعدت انه انت رح تكون معنا بكل خطوة فيها يا رب صلي انه ملكوتك يا رب يجي على 
هيدا الأرض يا رب صلي يا رب إنه مشيئتك تتحقق يا رب بهيدا ال... بهيدا العالم يا رب لأنه مشيئتك صالحة صالحة لكل الناس يا رب باركنا يا رب واجعل منا رجال ونساء صلاة بأسم يسوع Amen. 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 Christelle, thank you so much for your time. Mm. We continue to pray for you and for your nation. Thank you. Um, It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for listening to a 24 7 Prayer podcast. If you'd like to find out more about our work, why not visit 247prayer.com?